we sang um, a hymn near to the heart of God and as we talk about this subject never thirst again I hope by God's grace that we'll have a a new understanding of all of the blessings of being near to the heart of God um, let, let's have a prayer together if we could Holy God in heaven, we come before you uh, now on your Sabbath day again and we ask for your presence here. We have felt your presence here with us through our day so far and we long to hear more from, from your word and from your Holy Spirit. So guide and direct us, bless us. Uh, bless my mouth. May I honor and glorify you and the things that are spoken. And we praise you, we thank you, in Christ's name, amen. You know, if you remember, uh, and this text was in the Sabbath school lesson, Revelation 14, 12. Get out your Bibles, there's a few Bible texts to, to look at, but Revelation 14, 12, you know that verse. It says, here is the patience of the saints... Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We need the faith of Jesus. I think we've spent too long trying to muster up our faith and have stronger faith. We need a faith that we cannot muster up. We need a faith that comes from God alone. So we need to pray for that. You need to pray for that. Give me the faith of Jesus. Well, I do believe that sometimes to get that faith, we have to struggle with some things in life. You know, don't, don't be surprised if there are struggles in this life. You know, Christ said in this world we'll have many troubles, right? But take courage, I've overcome the world, right? So. We need the faith of Jesus. But Jesus didn't have just an easy road on this planet when he walked as a man, did he? No. He had as a matter of fact, his family was quite poor, as I understand it. And when he became an adult, I think he said, I don't have a place to lay my head. Does anyone know where his house was? <laughs> so... We need the faith of Jesus. We need more faith for this day that we live in. And I think that as we look at Scripture and see how God has dealt with us, human beings, that we gain a better understanding of the faithfulness of God. I, I really believe, I, I truly believe with all my heart, if we could get a grip on how faithful the living God is to you and to me. How all of heaven is concerned about you. It, it's easy to point to someone else and say, you know, God would, God would almost empty heaven to help you and to, to care for you and to, to, to make sure that you stay on the path and, and watch out for you and to protect you from the enemy. But it's a little harder to point that at yourself sometimes. That God loves me that much. Well, that is what breaks your heart. That is what makes a change in your heart. When you realize the love that God has for you and that you, you can take his word to the bank. Jesus Christ knew that. He learned that he could trust his father. If his father sent him somewhere, he didn't have to know where he was going or what, what was going to be the result. He knew that's where God wanted him and God would bless that travel, right? Well, we're thinking uh, in this subject today, Never Thirst Again, of John chapter 4. So if you want to turn there, John chapter 4.
Let's read, read a few texts from there. John chapter 4, starting at verse 1. In, in verse 1 of John chapter 4, it says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had, had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now why? Why must he go through Samaria? You see, he didn't go there just randomly. He was being led by his father, right? God, his father, sent Jesus our Savior there to Samaria for a purpose. Praise God, he sent the Holy Spirit to your town, wherever you were. And he brought you, right? God's... Faithfulness and love to his people on this planet is, there's nothing you can compare to it. Nothing in this world. No, no one in your life, even your mother, could not, none of them, no one could be as faithful to you as the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit have been to you. So, he left Judea, departed and, uh, into Galilee. He must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now listen to this closely. Jesus answered and said to her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Living water. We live in a world of death all around us. How many of you have had a loved one that has passed away at some point? Everyone in the room probably. Or at least a close friend, someone. We live in a world where you are expected to be born, grow up, and live and die. It's been going on for 6,000 years. We need living water. We need life. Again, just like the faith that we don't have, and we need it from above, we need this living water. But what I want you to take courage of is the fact that Jesus Christ will go far out of his way to give you that water. He is so faithful to you. He's so faithful to me that he will, he will pull everything together in heaven and on earth just to reach one soul. Here's this woman. Now, did he do this because she was a good woman? Well, he didn't come to you because you were a good woman or a good man either. He came to you because he loved you. He went this way and, the, and his father led him to this place because this was a woman thirsting for something that she didn't have in herself.
Aren't we told we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness? God is so faithful that he sent his son there to meet with this woman. And then he began to speak to her spirit, right? Not just a physical. It wasn't about water. What did he say to the disciples when they came back? I have meat to eat that you don't even know about. And he wasn't talking about physical food, right? So he began to draw out this woman into a relationship with himself. I truly believe that is life, to know God and his son whom he has sent. That is life, to know him. So this living water that will quench your thirst comes from him. That living water that you can trust that if you give your life to him and you ask him into your life, that he's not going to abandon you a year from now. When you fail the 10th time, the 20th time. How many husbands did this woman have? I hope none of you have had five. <laughs> But she's had five husbands, and she wasn't even living with one of them. Even in our culture today, it's pretty promiscuous, right? Did that stop Jesus Christ from reaching out and touching her heart? Did that stop Jesus Christ from offering her eternal life? Living water. That'll well up to eternity, right? Did, did, did that stop him? So why do you think that your failures stop God from loving you? Peter felt that way, right? When he failed and denied his Lord, even after, even after Christ warned him. I mean... <laughs> And he boasted, I'll, I'll never, you know, I'll never, I'll defend you to death, right? He meant it when he said it, but he failed, didn't he? Did that stop Jesus Christ from meeting him on the shoreline that day? And asking him three, three times, do you love me? That hurt. I know that hurt Peter's heart. But he needed it, right? He needed a little bit of sorrow and pain in order for him to grasp hold of his Savior and never let go. Well, that is what we need. We need to hold on to the Savior even in our failures. Satan would want to stamp you down into the earth. Just walk away. You're not even worthy to come to church this week. You're not even worthy to pray. Just go back to bed. Don't even get up. Do people sink into depression today? I don't know how you can sink into depression when you know the loving Savior is looking down with you with pity and love for you. That's what those people need. When you are in depression, if you are, and, and things don't seem like there's any way out, Remember how much Jesus loves you. Remember how much... He did not say, you know, we need to go around this well. There's a well down the way a little ways. I don't want to even... I don't want to be tainted by this filthy society here. Rather, he went out down there and he sat right where that woman would come. And waited. And then talked to her. Didn't force anything upon her. Talked to her and drew her heart into a relationship with himself. When you feel down and discouraged, remember the promises of God. Because he is faithful. He is faithful. And he has promised that if you drink from this water, you'll never thirst again. Why can he say that? Because you're faithful? Or because he's faithful? Because he's faithful. When he says to you, I'll come in and sup with you. 
I'm going to meet with you. I am going to write my law on your heart. It isn't because you are faithful. It's because he is faithful to fulfill his promise. You simply have to acknowledge it. Lord, I can do nothing to correct my path and my way. But I know that you are faithful and you are able to complete the work that you began in me when you saved me. As bad as I am and as bad as I have been and as many times that I have let you down and failed to live up to the purpose that you had for me, Lord, I know that you are able to complete the work that you began in me when you saved me. This is why he could say to that woman, if you ask of me, I will give you the water of life and you never have to thirst again because I will follow you throughout your life. I will care for you. I will embrace you and I will lead you. I will be your shepherd. I will, live you, I will lead you to living springs of water. I'll give you food. I'll give you water. I'll take care of you. Just keep your eyes upon me. He is faithful. He is able to do it. Now, what was the result then of this interaction? I find it really interesting. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. Okay, so he's bringing her to a spiritual understanding. He's not talking about physical water, right? But she needs to understand. Jesus says, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now, when we started this talk, we mentioned that text that says that the remnant people on this planet that are keeping the commandments of God, have a faith that they cannot supply for themselves. As a matter of fact, the Seventh-day Adventist Church cannot supply you with the faith of Christ. Pastor Putt, as much as we love Pastor Putt, and we, he cannot supply you with the faith of Jesus Christ. He can give his witness he can explain to you what he has learned and what he knows and, and encourage you to go to the source. That's what you need. You need to go directly. You need to go directly to the throne room of grace. And you need to plead the promises of Jesus Christ. You need to claim them and, 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 and believe them and go there and ask that God fulfill these things in you, in your life. Because he says that you, how many of you have accepted Jesus Christ in your life? I see almost every hand. I'm not going to ask who hasn't, but if you haven't, you're missing out on a life. In this world, there are many, many sorrows in this world, but the way of the transgressor is hard, and there is no better place to be walking through this sinful world than to be embraced by the Savior. No better place. Though things are hard and trials come and, and, and there are hurts and sorrows in this world, there is no better place than to be than to be in the safety of your Savior's arms. So give yourself to Him if you haven't. But you have come to Christ so what I'm saying to you folks is, you have asked for living water. Why do we think that he is in, un, unable to complete that work? Now, I, he can complete that work with you, and you, and you. But me, I'm a lost cause. Don't we, doesn't Satan want us to feel that way when you failed again, again? Again, 
You miserable failure. You're not worthy of the name of Jesus Christ. The reality is, of ourselves, none of us are worthy of the, of the name of Jesus Christ. But there is somebody who took your sin. There's someone whose blood is sufficient to cover every sin. So you don't stand in your own record. Do you understand that you do not stand as a Christian in your own record? You stand before the universe and before God with the record of Jesus Christ. His righteousness covers you. And he has said, I will come in, don't worry, I'll take care of your sin problem. I'm the great physician. I'll cure your problem. Just walk with me. Stay with me. And know that I love you. When a sparrow falls out of the tree, my father knows it. Are you not more valuable than many sparrows? How valuable are we? The king of the universe gave his life for you. This is why we shouldn't speak against each other, by the way. Because if I speak against you, Christ died for you. Who am I? Right? The love of God. The offer that He has. When, when you came to Christ, you repented of your sins and you turned to Him and you were baptized. You were given all things necessary for life and godliness. But Satan wants to keep you away from seeing all the promises of God. Well, there's only one way. I can, I can try to communicate, or someone who's better and more eloquent can, can teach or, or write a book or try to communicate you, to you the, the love of God and His faithfulness for you and all that He has to offer you. But there is one sure way to receive it, and that is to ask the guidance of the Holy Spirit and to spend time at the feet of Jesus Christ in this book every day. Out, an hour at least. Or more. This is life and death. We are living in a world that's soon closing. I don't know if you understand how close we are. All the signs, all the signs are there in increasing, like, like a woman in labor with birth pains getting closer and closer together. Do you remember when it, there was a time that it was strange to hear about a, a mass shooting? In America, anyway. Do you remember that there was a day when that was a rare occasion? It was devastating and it was rare. Is violence filling the land? Is immorality filling the land? But at the same time, is God working through His people to take a light to the world? Amen. We are in the very last throes of earth's history. So, what I'm trying to encourage you with today is that when your friend abandons you, and when your spouse abandons you, and when, yes, when a brother or sister at church abandon you. When you feel alone, the Lord Jesus Christ has not abandoned you. When we fail again and again and again, all that is needful is that we turn to Him again. A righteous man may fall seven times, but he gets up again. Right? How many times was Peter to forgive? Seventy times seven, right? The Lord Jesus Christ is not lacking in mercy and in love and compassion. And He will accept any penitent sinner, no matter how bad, no matter how many times that you have failed. So do not ever let anyone impress upon your heart and mind that He is not still there with you. And this is why I am saying that when you receive the water of life from the Lord Jesus Christ, He hasn't left you, even though at times you felt He did. He's still there. That's why you're here today. 
because he didn't abandon you when you failed. Otherwise, none of us would be here. We'd be back out in the world. We would. Do you know if he hadn't been causing that well of life to spring up in you, to guide you and direct you and, and to give you encouragement day by day, that every one of you would have fallen away? And me as well. But he's been faithful to me and he's been faithful to you. Let's look at uh, uh, John chapter 14. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we do that, let me just... Um, Jump down to verse, we're still in John 4. Look at what. What did the woman come for at the well? Water. And look what she did. Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot. <laughs> she was on a mission. She had something to do in the heat of the day, right? She left her water pot, went, went into the city, and said to the men, Now this is an immoral woman. Do you see what happens when the Lord Jesus Christ touches your heart? <laughs> then she says to them, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. What's her question? Is this not the Christ? Wow. Wow. Then it says, they went out of the city, came unto him. I'm, I'm going to skip down. By the way, in a way he rebuked, I don't know if you want to say rebuke, or he's teaching his disciples. He says, say ye not, in verse 35, the, the disciples had come back, there are not four months, then comes the harvest. He says, behold, lift up your eyes and look. The fields are white, all ready to harvest. He spoke to this woman. This woman went and spoke to the city, and the city came out to Jesus Christ. What impact do you think that this experience right here of this woman at the well had on that area in Samaria? Oh, my goodness. The blessing and the souls that were saved and the spreading of the truth about Jesus Christ. And then it says, in verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. Okay, her testimony. That's what she gave, right? That's it. She went and testified, but there was a, do you think there was a passion? She left her water pot. you got to come see this. Is this not the Christ? I mean, it wasn't some, um, from, you know, yeah, the Lord loves you, you know, right? <laughs> she was excited. She met the Savior. And then it says, the Samaritans came unto him. They besought him that he would tarry with them. Have you asked Christ to tarry with you? Don't leave me. Stay with me. We talked about this in Sabbath school today. You need him with you every day. Every day, and every part of the day and night. And he abode there two days, and it says, Many more believed because of his own word. So they listened to the Savior, and many were converted. And they said, Now we believe, not because of your sayings, for we have heard him ourselves. That, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is what you are called to do. To introduce someone to the Lord Jesus Christ so that they can hear him themselves. That's what you're called to do. All that we do, all, all the work that we do at the hilltop to, to, to care for those that Christ loves and to help them along in this hard life in whatever way we can it's all useless if we don't introduce them to Christ, right? It is. They need to see Christ in us, and we need to introduce them to a Savior. We can't force that upon them. But there are those seeking, and those that are looking, 
even in this our day, there are those that haven't rejected all religion and they're looking for an answer. Even though maybe religion has let them down many times. What they don't need, actually, they don't need a religion. They need a Savior. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's turn to uh, then to John 14. John 14, uh, f starting at verse 5. John 14, starting at verse 5. There are many spiritual benefits in Christ. Many things that the carnal mind will not just stumble upon. Because it isn't there. The carnal mind is in darkness. So there's only one source of light. So if we think that somehow we can go throughout life without picking this book up and studying and learning from the source of light, we're fooling ourselves. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that, again, that he abandons us. He will strive long with us and run after us again and again. But you know there are some that wander away and reject him. And then he will not force himself upon that person. May God bless you that you never do that. But that you draw near to him, seeking the spiritual benefits in Christ. Let's look at John 14 verse 5 says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not where you're going. And how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Have you ever been a little bit scared as a Christian? I don't know the way. I don't know what I need to do. It seems so complicated. What if I'm wrong? What if I get off track? What if I... What if I fail and, 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 and I'm lost? Do you know, those doubts don't even, you don't need to credit those thoughts. You need to simply look to Christ and say, I trust you. You said you're the way. I will walk with you. I will spend time with you. I will trust you as my shepherd. I know you will see me safely to the promised land. Is there a soul in this room that if you said that to him, that God would let you somehow fall off the path and fall off of a cliff somewhere along the line because he's too busy with the 90 and 9. Is there one? Would he not stop and say, wait a minute, one of my sheep needs me. That's you, my friend. That's you. Every one of us need him daily. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man com comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known the Father also. The scripture says, He who has the Son has life. It also says, He who has the Son has the Father. Listen, there's only one source of life in the universe. Does anyone know of another source of life? I'd like to know. With all of our science and all of our technology and all of our knowledge, are we not like the smartest generation to ever live? Is there any other source of life? Now I know what was the, the, the fountain, the water, fountain of life or whatever that they were looking for or whatever. They want, this, everyone wants to live forever, you know. But there's one source of life in the universe. And it is the Holy Father the Holy Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the source of life. Christ said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. If you'd known me, you would have known the Father, and from henceforth you know him. Why do we know, when, when you look at the world, and I, I, I've said this, but when you look at the wretched things in this world, when you look and that's not, I, I don't want to really touch on political things, but let's, let's talk about some of the children 
that are being used and abused in, in, in these caravans coming to America. Or let's, let's talk about human trafficking. The wickedness. Addicting people to heroin and then abusing them and selling them. and Okay, that's bad enough, right? What about little children not even living out their days? Dying at five years old in their mother's arms with a bloated belly and dying from starvation. Is that sad and sorrowing? So... The temptation from human nature is to say, you could stop this, God. So, God sent his son. God sent his son to this world so that you would know the heart of the Father. And he bound up the brokenhearted. He healed the sick. He wants to heal this world, right? He wants to heal this world. And soon that will be. Soon sin and suffering and sorrow will be put down never to rise again in the universe. And there will be no more sorrow and no more pain and no more crying and no more tears, right? But we're not there yet. So in your sorrow or when you see sadness or, or like one of these wicked people that walk into a church and shoot people, even little kids, point blank, just shoot them, right? Has that happened in our world? Right? That is the heart of Satan, not the heart of God. Now, why does God allow it? Because this experiment of sin has to play out. If God just snuffed it out, yeah, it'd be done. But the accusation would be, well, you better not, don't talk. Don't say anything about him. <laughs> he knows where you live. And we would serve him out of fear. He does not want a universe serving him out of fear. So the sin and what it is to be separated from God has been evident in our world. Hate sin. Don't hate the sinner. Hate sin and the results of sin and plead with God to unroot sin from your life. Because it's... Sin is death, and sorrow, and suffering, and pain. But the gifts of God are love, and joy, and peace, right? What God has to offer the world is goodness. So, then Philip said in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time with you and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And you say, How sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Now they're thinking in terms of physical, right? They want to physically see the Father. Jesus Christ is telling them that I am one with the Father and if you've seen me and known me, you know the heart of the Father. You know who He is and what He is like and what He believes and how much He loves you. So gaze upon Jesus Christ in your life. Open the Word of God and study and learn and grow in grace. Day by day. Let's jump down to verse... Let's jump down to verse... Uh, 15. Then it says in verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now what came first? Being connected with the Savior. Come to me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What then is the result and the fruit of that relationship? Once you fall in love with me, you're going to keep my commandments. Because you love me, and I am in you, and the Father is in me, and, 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 and we are one. And you will keep my commandments. And I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Notice it says another. Jesus Christ was their comforter at that time, right? 
But he says, I'm going to send another comforter. That is the Holy Spirit that will never leave you so that you never thirst again. That Holy Spirit will be there always with you. It's a gift. And what does the scripture say? I, I don't have the verse here, but what can separate you from the love of God? What was it? Okay, it's in Romans 8. Was there anything listed there in Romans 8 that can separate you from the love of the Father? Uh, from the love of God? Nothing. You have come to him that you might have life. I've come to him that I might have life. He will not abandon me. Though I'm a failure, he is not. And he is able to lead me on to paths of living water. You know, there's a verse in, hold on one second. Let me, let me jump down before I go there. It says in verse 23 of chapter 14, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our abode with him. This is a promise. How sure is this promise, I'm asking you? Believing the promises of God is having the faith of Jesus. This is the kind of faith that he had. Now, Satan tried to trip him up with that, with, with um, uh, what do you want to call it? Um, he... He tried to have him test his father. He said, well, throw yourself down. He'll, he won't let you break a bone. He didn't need to do that. He knew his father was there, right? And, and I don't have to prove anything to you. I mean, that is Christ's attitude. I know the father, but I don't have to do that. I don't have to test him. The fact of the matter is, how sure is this? When Christ says, if you love me, You'll keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he'll come unto him and make our abode with him. How sure is that, that you have the Holy Spirit, that God has promised you to have? Well, maybe it missed me. No. The problem is, we live with a lack of faith. And we don't need to. Because you have all the evidence in this book that Christ is faithful, and that God is faithful. If you will only come to him that you might have life daily and feed from the bread of life and receive the water of life daily, you will be so strengthened in your spiritual walk, once again, that you will be immovable and not able to be plucked out of his hand because you are settled into the truth. Have we heard that statement? That's your destiny as the people of God, to settle into the truth so that you cannot be moved. But that comes from His presence dwelling in you. And that comes from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It says in Romans 9.16, and I, I like this from the New International Version translation. It says the same thing in the other translations, but it's worded in a way that clicks with my mind and I, I understand it better. But Romans 9, 16, it says, it does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. It does not therefore depend on my desire or effort. It depends on his merciful, on, on his mercy. And my question to you is, how merciful is he? How merciful is he? Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. It says, verse 8, Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what saith... It, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if 
you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. How merciful is he? Just believe. I am the Savior. The Lord sent me to the earth and died for your sins, and I live again. Just believe. Now, why can he say to you, you'll be saved? What if you wandered away from the path? He can say that because he's faithful to make it happen so long as you stay with him. See, it's always up to you to walk. We don't believe in once saved, always saved, right? That once you accept, you cannot be lost. You can walk away, but there is only one person in this universe that can make that so, because we just talked about the fact there is nothing that can separate you from God except your own choice. So, Satan wants to hold carrots up to you in your life. You know what? You'd rather have this job, this promotion. You'd rather have this person, this life. You'd rather have this, that, or the other. And we make a choice, some people do, to stop following the shepherd and to turn away. Don't do it. Hold on to him with both hands. Do not let go of the Savior. It's your choice. Now, that doesn't mean the temptation isn't there. That's when you fall on your face before the Lord and plead with him. Lord, do not let me do this. Do not let me fall away. And again, how faithful is he? He says, you're going to be saved. Just stay with me. Believe in me. Walk with me. Let me guide you. You have eternal life. I will give you a well of water springing up in your heart and life, and you will never thirst. I will supply all your needs to the very end. And then in verse 13 it says, For whosoever call, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let me turn to Revelation 7.17 7, and we're going to be winding down here. Um, Revelation 7 verse 17 says... For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Do you long for a day of no more sorrow and no more pain and no more suffering? Follow your shepherd. He will lead you, it says. He'll feed you. And he'll lead you to living fountains of waters. Just walk with him, abide with him, and follow him. In Revelation 21.6, it says, Revelation 21.6, And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. How merciful is he? Remember the text? It doesn't depend on my desire or effort, but upon his mercy. He is willing, if I am a thirst like the woman at the well was to give unto me freely of the water of life. Two more texts. John 6.35. Let's look at John 6.35. 
John 6, verse 35. says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Do you want your spiritual life to be full? Come to Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the bread of life. He will give you the water of life, right? Freely, the scripture says. Now, in closing, let's read Revelation twenty-two seventeen. Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is athirst come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Let's pray. Lord God, fill our cup. Here we are coming to you for the water of life, coming to you for the bread of life. Lord, we trust you that you are a good shepherd, that you will not let us see harm, but that you will care for us through this dark world in all the sorrows and trials and troubles that we face, that you will guide us through that weary land and that you will deliver us to the promised land. Lord, you are a trustworthy Savior. We believe this, and we place our souls in your hands, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.